Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, good morning. My name is Ray Bittner. I have the pleasure to introduce Don Matson today. He's a local Xilinx field applications engineer. He's uh, offered to do a series of three talks for us on the newest Xilinx tools, and today we'll be talking about uh, Vertex 6 and Spartan 6. Don? Thank you, Ray. <clears throat> good morning, and uh, as Ray said, I'm going to be talking about Vertex 6 and Spartan 6. These are our newest families. I'll start by talking about uh, Spartan 6, and then I'll cover uh, Vertex 6. And at the end, I'll have a little bit of a summary. Um, go ahead. If you do have questions, we'll try and make this a little bit interactive um, in case I miss something. Um, so with that, let's get started um, with Spartan 6. And normally when I talk about Spartan 6, people say, what happened to Spartan 4 and what happened to Spartan 5? And you can see I get a lot of responses and uh, some people think that our marketing department couldn't count. Some think it's just because it's better than Spartan 3. Others because uh, Xilinx wanted to highlight the commonality. And then the final choice was it is the sixth generation of uh, Spartan devices. So if you count generations and you go back, this is really the sixth generation of, of Spartan devices. And Spartan devices have always been optimized to deliver a balance of cost, um, power, and performance. And probably originally, the original ones were more cost and performance. And as we've gotten into these later architectures, uh, power has become a bigger issue. Um, <clears throat> so that is... Spartan 6, and as I go through here, you will see, for those who have done FPGA work, that Spartan 6 and Vertex 6 are really derivatives of Vertex 5. So um, that's another part of the reason for calling it um, Spartan 6 as well. So Spartan 6 is on a 45 nanometer process. Um, it is a low power process. For those who have used our FPGAs, um, we've always used what would be considered either the general purpose or the high, high performance process before. Um, so this is the first FPGA that we've done using the low power process. Um, you'll see that we're going to offer a couple different platforms, an LX series device and an LXT series device. And the T stands for transceivers, um, which means our gigabit transceivers are in there. Um, and then you can see we have a rollout in mid-2009 of those devices. And I'll talk when I get to the family chart a little bit more about what sort of is our rollout schedule for hardware and software and documentation. So that said, I did say it is a, a 45 nanometer process. Um, and one of the things you'll see is as we are rolling to to 45 here, you will see that there are some significant advantages just from, from the power standpoint um, as in here. As well, um, <clears throat> let's see, we'll just move. So Spartan devices as opposed to Vertex devices, um, Spartan devices are really aimed for the high volume market. That's what we're targeting. Um, and you can see that in this slide I'm showing we've had some pretty good growth or very good growth in our Spartan families over the, um, this last decade. Um, and we're also going to talk a little bit about what we're doing in packaging. So just to make sure everybody's aware, Spartan is what we're, we're aiming for the high volume market and the Vertex is the guys who are really are after some significant performance. Um, and so those are, that's sort of how we're um, positioning the two families. Um, that said, here's, 
here's sort of what we see as the market needs for um, that high volume. So we need to minimize application cost. We do that by doing things to minimize um, the power supplies you need. So in the Spartan family, you need a VCC int supply to power the core. And in Spartan 6, that's 1.2 volts. And a VCC O supply for your IOs. And that can be anything from 3.3 volts all the way down to 1.2 volts. Um, in addition to that, there's a VCC aux supply um, so that certain I.O. standards and certain things have a dedicated supply. That supply can be either 2.5 volts or 3.3 volts. So if I need just a 3.3 volt uh, system, I only need to supply two power supplies, one for VCC O and VCC aux off of 3.3 and then uh, supply for VCC int. So that helps with, with the cost. The other thing we'll talk about is how do we, we address more getting additional bandwidth. In particular with Spartan device, it isn't so much how much I can run inside the device or the speed that I can run inside the device. It's more about um, how can I get things onto the chip. And that's been the main emphasis to in, in improving performance on Spartan 6. And then, um, when we get to the slides on power, you'll see where we've, we've made significant improvements there. And then when we look at the device family, you'll see that it's more than 2x the size of our previous Spartan devices. So let's just talk a little bit about um, some of the things we're doing to meet uh, low cost. First, when we look at the packages, what you'll see is we sort of break these into um, a few groups. So there's the old TQ package. That's for the guys who are doing prototypes, who um, really, you know, if I'm doing a flat panel display, I got a lot of board area and I want to minimize board layers. So having a TQ package makes sense. Um, then this is probably where most of our app customers are at, um, the one millimeter ball pitch uh, packages. And then we have some chip scale packages here. And uh, those are the 0.8 millimeter ball pitch. And there is some additional packaging coming on Spartan, particularly to reach, um, put more logic into a small space. So, um, but these are the initial packages that will roll out. So. Um, in addition to packaging, some things that we can, yeah. Um, in, in the chip scale, uh, is that uh, like a bare die, or is there a, a, a you know, camera? So, um, the question was: Is in the chip scale package, is it a bare die um, chip scale package? All of these packages are really wire bond packages, which I mean, this kind of shows it looking more like a a flip chip, but really the die is upside down on the package, and then there's wire bonds out, and then it's got a lid on top of the package. So that's all of so, these so devices. The thermal, the, the thermal resistance is the, the die is bonded to the to metal uh, cover, and then that metal cover is what you can couple to. Yes, um, so the, the question was is the thermal resistance is, is there a cover on top of the die? Yes, there is a cover on top of the die and you can put the uh, heat sink on top of that. Um, and that does help with the uh, thermal impedance. But if I, you compare these devices to the Vertex devices, all the Vertex devices are flip chip packages and the majority of the heat is actually conducted out through the leads and the Vertex devices um, offer a much higher thermal performance. So, hopefully that answers that question. So, um, also, to help with, with reducing system costs, we've started implementing a significant number of hard blocks inside the devices. And uh, what this slide is showing is some of the blocks that are in the Spartan FPGA. 
So the first one that it shows is this SRAM controller, and I'll talk about it um, in a little bit more in a few slides. But the important thing there is we've actually made a hard controller and put it on the Spartan device. Um, so that saves you logic. It also saves you development time because it's much easier to, to use. Um, we introduced in Vertex 5 a uh, PCI Express endpoint. Um, in Vertex 5, it can be a by 1, by 2, by 4, or by 8 in a Gen 1 PCI Express. In Spartan 6, it is a by 1 Gen 1 endpoint. So 2.5 gig. Um, in addition, we um, have put in the DSP blocks in here if people are doing some processing. Um, the original Vertex 2 Pros put in multipliers, um, hard multipliers, 18 by 18s. Um, in Vertex 4, we introduced a DSP, what we call the DSP 48. It's basically a multiplier followed by an accumulator. Um, in Spartan 6 and in Vertex 6, that multiplier accumulator structure will have a, uh, a pre-adder in front of it as well. So if you think, if you think about classical fur filters, FFTs, or uh, even, yeah, or those two applications, it, it's often quite nice to have that pre-adder. So it's a hard silicon block, it cascades. And I'll talk a little bit more about it in, in um, the uh, Vertex 6 time. But that is in Spartan 6 as well. There are some, some differences between it, but both devices have the multiplier, the accumulator in there. And they have multiples in there. So another thing we've done in Spartan land to make things easier, and actually do this in Vertex as well, is we've made it easier to configure with commodity SPI PROMs or, or Flash. Um, we started making that switch a few years ago. We, we now support um, SPI PROMs from multiple vendors, although you might not want to buy them from Spanion right now. They're not doing so well. Um, but um, they have added capabilities now. They've gone not only by one, but by two, by four. We've put some intelligence into the Spartan FPGA. So if you tell it to uh, configure with an SPI PROM, you no longer need to give it those variant select or vendor select pins. You don't have to set those because we're going to interrogate the SPI PROM and determine what, who's, who's out there and then do the appropriate things to pull the bitstream off. The other thing we're showing here is we're showing that um, you can put multiple images in that flash and have the uh, Spartan device boot from one image and then give it a, have it do some checking and then boot from a second image if you wanted as well. So those things have been worked on for a while now and we've made some improvements there. Next area I wanted to talk about is the IOs. What have we done in Spartan? six IOs to allow us to get higher speeds. And you'll see we talk about 1.0 uh, gig per second um, in the general purpose LBDS IOs. Um, those who have used high speed LBDS know that the challenge usually lies not in capturing the signal at the first register, but how do I get it from that first register at whatever speed it's in to a parallel form to get it into my the rest of my fabric to run it. And I'll talk a little bit about that. And then, of course, we've talked about the gigabit transceiver. So I'll talk about that. Just so you're aware, here are all the memory interfaces that are supported by Spartan. And just these last ones here in Spartan 6 are supported in the devices that are LTX, where the T stands for transceivers. So those are ones that are supported with the transceivers. The the general purpose IOs look like this, and I want to make sure everybody's aware that our general purpose IOs are full 3 volt tolerant. So if you've used Spartan before, you know that Spartan 3A has a, the ability to do hot socketing or be in a hot swap application, and 
withstand full three volt uh, IOs and we're doing the same thing in Spartan 6. And I need to contrast that a little bit with, with Vertex 6 because Vertex 6, the IOs, the maximum IO voltage it'll withstand is 2.5 volts. Um, so, and that was done to improve performance there. Those who have used either Vertex 4 or Vertex 5 will kind of recognize this block. What's off over here is my output buffer, and over here is the input buffer. Um, but over here I have this iLogic block, which is my deserializer. This is on every I.O. pin. And then pins are sort of paired together with the idea that if I want to bring in LVDS or some other differential signal, I need to have them come into a pair. And so this is, these two are paired together, and this would be like the P, and this would be the N uh, input. And I can make this would be the master deserializer, and this would be the slave. And with that, I can deserialize either uh, 1 to 2, 1 to 3, 1 to 4, 5. Um, no, I can't do 5. Yeah, I can do 5, 6, 7, 8. So any of those numbers, and that's how the deserializer um, works in combination. If I just bring it in single-ended, I can do 1 to 4 is the maximum. So somewhere we talk about DDR3, that's a single uh, uh, ended standard and that will come in at 400 megahertz, it's DDR, so uh, 4 to 1 on that means that coming out of here this deserializer will give me 4 bits at 200 megahertz going to the fabric, going to the hard endpoint. So just so everybody's aware of that, um, and likewise, that was the input logic. There's also a serializer over here to do the same thing going out, and it's trying to show that I have a data path, and then the tri-state enable also needs some sort of uh, ability to be serialized as well. So those are those two blocks. And then the last block here is the I.O. delay. Um, so in the Vertex 4, we introduced the I.O. delay. This is a similar function, it allows me to programmably come in through this dynamic reconfiguration port and adjust where my delay, input delay tap is. So that is probably the biggest change in the I.O. for Spartan and that will give us the ability to do that gigabit LVDS or do the high speed um, memories. So. When I'm talking about IOs, we talked a little bit about the transceiver block. This is just a high-level view of the what we call the GTP in uh, Vertex uh, 5 or in Spartan 6. And this is the transceiver. It's the same transceiver used, or I shouldn't say the same. It was ported from Vertex 5 to Spartan 6. So it's ported from a 65 nanometer process to a 45 nanometer process, which is one of the reasons where we believe that we will have very good success. Um, it's something that we've been producing now in volume for quite a while, and we're ready to make it available in our Spartan devices. Um, there is a couple of differences that are important for the transceivers, and I don't know how many in here have used the transceivers, um, but in Vertex 5, those people who've used the gigabit transceivers know that our transceiver pairs are put in a tile. A tile contains two transceivers. And in that tile of two transceivers, there is one PLL. And so you can, for your, two, your transmitter or for your two transceivers, they can work off of that one PLL if their clocking rates are um, related in some nice integer divider ratios. Um, in Spartan 6 and in Vertex 6, We've changed the structure and we've added a PLL for the TX and a PLL for the RX. Now the PLL on the RX path is optional, optional so if you're running PCI Express, you probably don't want to bother to turn it on. It, it's going to just burn a little extra power. But it does give me the ability to take PCI Express in on one channel, which is running at 2.5 gig, and then run the other channel or the other transceiver 
at something else, like a video um, HD SDI rate. So, so that's our uh, transceiver. I mentioned before that we've put in a hard memory controller. This hard memory controller is only in Spartan devices, and this um, memory controller has um, a controller interface to the memory that can either be 8, 4, or 16 bits. If I configure it at 16-bit memory interfaces, um, that, that'll be the majority I can do. Um, on the user side, I get six 32-bit um, programmable ports to the fabric. So if I had a microblaze or a processor, I could have the processor uh, hooked up to one, one of those ports. Um, the ports can be either write-only, uh, read-only, or read-write. Um, and it's a very simple FIFO type interface, so relatively easy to use. Um, and this will give it, make it easier for our customers to hook up to these high performance memories, get the, get the design up and running quickly. So, um, then the last area I want to talk about is twice the capabilities, half the power. Um, and I'm going to start here by, by looking at the fabric. And I want to contrast, so this is where Spartan 3 is today. You'll see the 4 lot followed by a register. And you'll see that Vertex 4 also had that same structure. Vertex 5, we went to a 6 lot uh, followed by a, a flip-flop. And then there was an, it's actually 6 inputs and 2 outputs. And that second output was just available to the fabric. And we've done some studies. And we said, hey, for a lot of designs where we want to increase the performance, having that extra flip-flop here is a very easy thing to add. And so we've added that. It also gives us the advantage of when I make this LUT into a distributed memory, I now can put twice as many, much distributed memory in the same area. So a 32 deep distributed memory and two bits wide is what I can put into that area, whereas with Vertex 5, it's 32 by 1. So that's um, in both Vertex and Spartan. The BRAM, we've made a couple, we've actually made some multiple changes there. Um, probably the biggest one is in Spartan devices, um, the ratio of logic to BRAM was relatively low. So we've pretty much doubled the ratio of BRAM to logic in Spartan 6 over Spartan 3. The other thing we've done is we've taken these 18K BRAMs and we allow it to be fractured into two independent 9K BRAMs. Um, and a lot of times people didn't need the full depth of the 18K BRAM and so now you can, you can get a better utilization out of that memory. Um, and that's very much similar in Vertex 6. Um, this primitive, the base primitive, is still a 36K BRAM, and it can be fractured into two 18K BRAMs. So um, that's one of, one of the things. We've also done um, some enhancements to the block RAMs because we're interested in reducing power in both Vertex and Spartan. When we were designing them, we found some ways inside to um, reduce the power. And just so you know, in Spartan, the BRAMs will run somewhere, or if you use the full pipeline modes, uh, 270, 300 megahertz, somewhere in there, 250 to 300, depending upon your device. And in Vertex, that'll be uh, 500 to 600 megahertz, if you use the pipelining options. Okay, clocking. So. Those of you who've used Vertex 5, this block should look very familiar. It's a PLL and two DCMs. Um, those are Spartan uh, 3A DCMs coming over. So if you have Spartan code, your DCMs will, will come on over. We've added this PLL. The PLL has a VCO that's going to run somewhere between 500 
to 500 megahertz to gigahertz, and then you have five divider taps that you can set coming off of that. And that'll go to your clocks. We've done a lot of work on the clocking in order to support the high-speed IOs. There are some dedicated clocking paths um, for getting clocks from the PLL out to the IOs um, as well. Um, this slide I just wanted to highlight, you know, what kind of performance boost do we get using Spartan 6 versus um, Spartan 3? So we just take the microblaze and give you some relative performance numbers as we switch from um, a Spartan 3 architecture and just move it to Spartan 6. You can see we do get a, a nice little boost in performance. In general, Spartan 6 will be, you know, a little better, a little faster than Spartan 3. I mean, we're not uh, trying to really push the speed aspect on Spartan 6. However, we are doing everything we can to reduce um, the dynamic and static power. And so you can see we're, we're showing roughly about 50% reduction in power. And this slide here, what we did is I took or we took the largest Spartan 3A device. It's a 3A, uh, what we call the DSP device. Um, so it had twice the memory that the standard Spartan devices had. So it was roughly comparable in the, to the sort of a mid-range Spartan 6 device. And if you just take this, this 3A device and, and compared it to here, you'll see that we, just through process, we're getting roughly about a 50% uh, power savings. Additional power savings is available if you move from um, a 1.2 volt core to a 1.0 volt core. So let me explain what we're doing. As we're designing these devices, we're designing them to do something we call voltage scaling so that the device can be either run at 1.2 volts or 1.0 volts. When we do voltage scaling on the Vertex 6, voltage scaling will either allow the core to run at 1.0 volt or 0.9. So, um, and it's just an option that you order and you can get the device in there. Uh, yes? What are, your, what are your projections for voltage levels for your upcoming parts? Mike, your question was what are my, our projections for voltage levels? Do you see, do you see yourself scaling down to 0.7 or are you plateauing at 0.9 or 0.8? Um, the question was, I, and I think what you're really asking is, is when we roll out the next generation beyond here, at 32 nanometers, will we be scaling voltage? My expectation is, is that we would, but I have not, I have not checked on that. I mean, I could certainly ask and find out. Um, so, welcome. Um, so this just shows you where we're at um, with our power. Um, I want to show you some of the features that are added in, in power. Um, so these are hardware features that have been added over the years. Um, you know, the ability to stop clock, the buff uh, Gs have had that ability for quite a while, or you could do it um, another way. Um, hibernate the idea that, hey, I'm going to just power off the FPGA. We've added suspend, voltage scaling, and now um, when we go into suspend, we've added the ability to use some of the pins inside the, the device to wake up. So, so not all the pins go asleep. So I could have an interrupt pin coming into the FPGA to wake it up. I don't have to have an external processor to wake it up. Um, and it's a lower power platform. One of the things I should mention is we've done a lot of work on our software. And you know, the initial software, and I think we've been doing, there are power options in MAP and, and PAR to reduce power. Um, we're simply just clean up routes. You know, hey, what can I do to clean up this route? And you know, we didn't get a whole lot of power savings. Um, we did run the 11.1 recently on a design comparing it to 10.1 on a LX 
on a Vertex 5 LX110 device, and what we saw there was 13% improvement in performance or in power reduction. And we kind of expect somewhere in that 10% range can be handled, uh, can be achieved through software alone. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Um, and then the last thing as we're bringing all these devices or building these devices, people want to be able to test them. You want to get boards, you want to, you want to be able to build your system. Um, we're working to not only build the base platform or the devices, um, we're rolling out boards um, to targeted areas. We're putting IP on those boards, putting reference designs of it, making those available to customers. We're trying to do as many things as we can to help you guys be able to, to do your designs in a quick and efficient time. So that said, here's the family of devices. And uh, the LX16 device is, we have got some devices back. We have an early sample of that. We have a demo board that we took to uh, ESC conference back in, in February. Um, <clears throat> that's the first device. It will be generally available in the July timeframe. And then the next couple devices are the LX45 and the LX45T, which is a uh, August, September timeframe, and then the 150. Those three devices will be the first three devices sampling. Um, and I think all three of those are scheduled to be in production um, the end of the year. Yes? Yeah. Um, volume prices, the guy in the back right there, that's Michael Pierce. He's our sales rep. And uh, he can get you some guidelines as to what kind of pricing to expect. Um, with volumes, and it's just a question of volumes and time. But as an FAE, they don't, they don't like me to talk about that. <laughs> so um, I haven't mentioned anything about pricing, and I don't know if you've looked, um, you know, at a Spartan 3. Um, obviously, the Spartan 6 will give us the ability to put a lot more transistors, a lot more logic cells in the same area. So there will be um, some price reductions compared to Spartan 3s. Yes? Two questions. First, uh, do the hard blocks save me power on memory, specifically? And the second, ICAP port on Spartan? Anything new? Yeah. So I think there's, there's two questions there from Sandro. The first one, um, hard blocks, do they save you power? And the answer is yes, hard blocks always save power over the embedded or over a soft block, um, simply because it's dedicated routes. Um, it can be built a lot smaller. And typically, we only do hard blocks on, on pieces of IP that we see that there's significant savings in doing that. Um, yeah. Well, I have numbers on how much power a DSP block, or I could, I could do a fur filter with or without it. Um, the numbers are fairly dramatic. Um, PCI Express um, would be an interesting one to do. I mean, it would be easy to do a hard versus soft. Um, you see, <coughs> SRAM is a lot less pop than DDR. Yeah, so I think your question on, so on the, on the memory, I think the, a better way to, or how I would like to think about it is, is you know, the memory controller inside there should save you a fair amount of power. We made sure it's, it addresses three particular standards. D and I mentioned a couple of them, DDR3, DDR2, and the other one that we get a fair amount of requests for is low power DDR, simply because it's a low power or mobile DDR is the other name that it's called. And so um, I, th I think we'll be able to demonstrate significant savings and when we've got boards, we'll get you some of those numbers. Um, the other question was ICAP, and I'm not exactly sure what the question is. I, I can guess. 
and I, I think I'll, I'll take a stab at that. So obviously there's an ICAP in Spartan devices. There has been for a number of years. Um, the area that some people are most interested in ICAP for is reconfiguration. And we've always said, don't bother with reconfiguration in Spartan devices because there was a potential memory glitch when doing uh, rewriting a, a logic cell from back to its same value. Uh, with um, Spartan 6, there is no memory glitch. We, the devices are designed for partial reconfiguration. Um, so that is in Spartan 6. Yes? One more thing about the memory. I think you said that there is no hard, hard block for DDR in the Vertex 6, right? Yes. So you would still be using MIG? You would, you would still be using MIG to do the memory controllers in Vertex. And the reason for that is it's with the Spartan class device, it's, it isn't that, I, I guess actually it's easy to say, hey, if I put a 16-bit wide uh, DDR3 out there, I probably cover the memory bandwidth that multi most applications need. With Spartan devices, I need the ability to tailor it a lot more. And so with Vertex devices, we've, we give the user the ability to customize it. And, uh, and, I, and the fabric is fast enough to allow you to do that. So, um, the last slide here on Spartan, actually I got a couple reference slides that I'll throw in as well. Really the last slide here is on the um, timeline and I don't have an equivalent slide for Vertex, so I'm gonna comment about Vertex because it's almost identical. So documentation, early access documentation to both uh, Vertex 6 and Spartan 6 was opened up the uh, end of last year. So first of this year. And so if you go out to the web, you go xilinx.com slash 6, you'll go to a, a Spartan 6 Vertex 6 homepage. You'll find that there's an eight page overview brief that pretty much covers all the information that I'm gonna be covering today for both Spartan and Vertex. But in the early access document lounges, there's probably, there's well over a thousand pages of documentation on the major features of Spartan 6 and Vertex 6. And so if somebody needs access to it, you know, my contact information was on the first slide. It's don.matson, M-A-T-S-O-N, at xilinx.com. And uh, we can work to get you early access documentation. Um, early access software um, happens the end of this month. So um, there will be a limited number of customers with that. What I don't have on here, well, I guess general ES, third quarter, just to be so everybody's aware, it's actually um, July um, will be the release. So first of July, you should be able to target um, both Spartan 6 and Vertex 6. And as I said before, it's the July time frame, the first Spartan device, the 16 will be out in general sampling, and it's the May time frame for the first Vertex 6 device. Um, so that's kind of the timeline we're on. I put these next two slides in here. These are just references for people who have used uh, Spartan 3A. Just to compare um, Spartan 3A on logic cells to um, Spartan 6. And so you can see that we've got significantly larger devices and this just gives people a way to compare. And I also broke down the comparison on this slide. I said compared to number of block RAM bits. So this is just looking at block RAM bits. Um, and so you can see that there's a lot more memory in these devices. Yes? If I remember right, there is a Spartan with an embedded flash. Are you gonna do something like that for this one? Yeah, so the question was, is we do have some Spartan devices out there, Spartan 3AN, that have an embedded flash um, available. And will we do something with Spartan 6? Um, I think that the devices have been designed to allow us to uh, put additional devices on there if we wanted. So we could put a flash, we could put a DDR3 out there. Um, 
our goal though right now is getting um, Spartan 6 and Vertex 6 released in, on schedule. And uh, also there's another thing, uh, ISE software is, is ongoing. There's a lot of work being done there. So that's our primary focus and we're investigating whether we should. So, um, so just showing here a road map, you see that uh, we do have um, our Spartan 3A family out now. We will be releasing um, Spartan 6 um, earlier in the middle part of this year and then the devices with the transceivers. And you'll see that there's also something coming in, in 45 nanometers we call Dragonfire. I think there will be an architectural announcement at the end of this month or early next, next month on that. So with that, I'd like to transition from Spartan to Vertex 6. Are there any other questions on Spartan before I go to Vertex? Okay. Um, so in, in Vertex land, the care abouts from our customers are a little bit different. Um, performance is probably the number one or is the number one concern, but power is not too far behind. So much like Spartan, our customers are caring about power. Um, they do care about cost. So we're, we've done a number of things in Vertex to make it easier for people to lay out boards. So the Spartan devices, the packages were wire bond uh, packages. In Vertex, they are all flip chip packages. We've done extensive amount of engineering of the package to support the high speed transceivers. We've also put all of the um, bypass, not all of, the majority, vast majority of the bypass capacity you need for the devices are on the flip chip devices in Vertex land. And that um, helps to reduce costs. The other thing we've done is we've done as much as we can to min keep the number of power supplies to a minimal. So those are some of the things that we've been doing there. Um, when I talk about uh, Vertex, you know that we've had multiple families in Vertex. And in Vertex 6, we have the LXT family and the SXT family that we've announced. And we will be announcing something later this year and actually sampling something with the high-speed transceivers at the end of the year. So that's where we're at. Um, let's just talk about performance. Compared to Vertex 5, the fabric should be about one speed grade faster. The transceivers um, in Vertex 5 were basically um, 3.2 gig. They're now all base transceivers are 6.5 gig, so um, roughly twice as fast. We've done some things on the I.O. to allow us to run at a higher speed. And you can see that we're going to be able to run DDR3 at uh, 1066. And we've done a number of little things in the clocking. It says clocking is 10% faster overall. But there's a number of things that have been done in clocking to really help those guys doing high performance designs. And uh, the DSP, those people using DSP blocks, you'll see that even in, in all the devices, there's a a lot more DSP resources available, and so we'll talk about that. This slide looks familiar, so we won't say much about it, other than that the fabric does have, is the same as the Spartan 6, um, and it's derivative from Vertex 5. Block RAMs, much the same story. Um, we've done some enhancements to improve the FIFO performance, so you know there is a dedicated hard block FIFO in that uh, 36K BRAM. Um, and, you know, um, so you have one FIFO or you can split it and use it as two independent uh, BRAMs. And we've also added in, we added error correction in if you use the FIFO as a, as a or you, you not the FIFO, if you use the block RAM as a 72-bit wide data path or 64-bit data path with the 8-bit extra for correction, there is an ECC block available on all of the BRAMs in Vertex. In addition to that, we've added some uh, 
an extra capability on that ECC logic to allow you to inject errors, to test it, verify that it's working. So it's sort of our second generation of ECC logic for the BRAMs. Um, as I mentioned before, we've put in some new performance paths on the, on the clocks. The other things we've done is we've, we've, moved, we've added um, midpoint buffering to reduce global skew. If you've used the regional clock buffers, um, you know that in Vertex 5 they're limited to 250 megahertz. They're now, those regional clock buffers have been changed to be differential clock buffers to reduce any jitter or noise that they might see, and their performance has been increased to the 500 megahertz range. And so that has happened as well. Um, we have a, up to 18 mixed mode uh, clock managers. The clock managers are all PLL based in here. Um, all pins have the I.O. delay, so you do have the ability to still do I.O. delay. The refinements in the I.O. delay is, is that um, we've done a number of things to reduce the power and also to increase the accuracy of the tap delays. Um, and we have reduced the total number of taps. So in Vertex 5, you could have 64 taps. In Vertex 6, you're down to 32 taps. The idea being that for higher speeds, I don't need that really long tap delay, and that costs me a lot of power area and jitter performance. So that's why we've made that change. Um, as we look at the DSP block, so this is showing the DSP slice. As I mentioned before, the DSP slice is similar in Spartan 6 to what you see here. So what I'm showing is one slice. You'll see that I have an A and a B input, um, and I have a pre-adder coming in here. So I could have a coefficient coming in here. I could have, uh, for a, a fur filter, I could have my coefficients wrapped around. So I come in here and adding and then multiplying. And you'll see that that multiplier is a 18 by 25 in Spartan, or in Vertex 6, much like it was in Vertex 5. So that bigger multiplier allows more dynamic range. The uh, accumulator is still a 48-bit accumulator in both Spartan and Vertex. And then the other thing I'm showing is, is most of our uh, DSP software takes advantage of the fact that I can, can run a cascade of these really nicely um, to um, greatly uh, reduce power by using the direct routes and keep performance up in that high range. So it's 500 megahertz for a dash one, 550 dash two, 600 for a dash three. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, there's roughly twice as many as there was before. Now all of the um, Vertex devices have a built-in PCI Express block, and they all have some built-in Ethernet Mac blocks as well. And those Ethernet can be 10, 100, 1 gig. Um, and the PCI Express block here, the, since the transceivers support um, 6.5 gig or up to 6.5, the transceivers are all, uh, or I should say the PCI Express block can be either Gen 1 or Gen 2, and it can support up to four lanes Gen 1 endpoint. Um, and it has the ability or the hooks necessary to allow you to... Uh, um, um, hooked to an endpoint as a, as a downstream device from you. So um, that capability is new. Um, as I mentioned before, the uh, memory performance has been boosted, so we now support um, 1066 in, for DDR3. Um, and we also support 1.4 gig for the LBDS I.O. So, and the rest of that should look very familiar to those who have done Vertex 5. Um, <clears throat> so, sort of as I mentioned before, our transceivers will be GTX um, on the base devices, and then we'll be introducing a device later called GT, or HXT devices with a 
with the other transceiver. So much like um, in Spartan, we have a lot of hard IP in Vertex. Um, one of the blocks I hadn't talked about before is there is a system monitor block on all Vertex 5 and in Vertex 6 uh, devices that allows you to do uh, monitor voltages and temperatures internal to the device and also monitor uh, voltages external to the chip if you want. So from a power standpoint, what you can see is both the, the uh, static and the dynamic power is reduced in Vertex 6 when compared to Vertex 5. Um, and, you know, roughly we say it's going to be about 30% lower um, power if you're running at a 1.0 volt core. If you use the voltage scaling in Vertex, um, you'll get um, about 50% reduction. Now, one thing you should be aware of is if you look on your charts, you'll see that uh, on the Spartan devices, the speed grades are dash 2 and 3 by default and there's a dash 1L speed grade, and that dash 1L is, you know, that's at 15% slower than the regular Spartan devices. In Vertex, do you have a um, dash 1, 2, and 3, and then there is also a dash 1L, and that dash 1L is roughly the same performance as the dash 1. So, you know, it's somewhere in the performance range of a dash to vertex 5. So um, that's our story there on power and uh, we'll just move on to the um, slide here that shows all of the IOs here and devices. So one thing to be aware of as I, as I mentioned if you look the number of DSP slices, it's much higher. And if you look at the DSP, you'll see that we have a couple of devices that have significant amount of DSP um, elements and memory. So the smaller devices, because the DSP block is relatively small to add, um, we have a higher number of DSP blocks. And as you go up larger, we say, hey, if you really are interested in DSP, you want to go this way as opposed to going up on these devices, just so you're aware of what's going on there. As I said, all devices here are uh, flip chip, and all of them have the um, I.O. or the, the majority of the capacitance already on the chips. Um, we've done some things to improve signal integrity of the packages. Um, and we've been doing our design on the packages with the idea that the transceivers need to be capable to run 10 gig, even though we're putting lower speed transceivers, and that's guiding our package development. So um, I guess the last thing, earlier I said that this device, the 240T, is the first device out, and you can see when that device samples, the first package will be the 1156 and the other two packages will be sh followed short after. As those device packages are available, we're able to at least put something in any footprint that somebody would want. With the exception of our friends who like to do big ASIC prototypes, we have built a, a device specially for them. And that gives you the three quarters of a million flip-flops. So that's a big one. So um, that's what I had on, on Vertex. What I want to do now is just kind of summarize things by just showing you the structure and just kind of show what things are, are common between uh, Vertex and Spartan and what isn't. So what's common in there is, you know, the LUT CLB is the same, the block RAM structure, while the size of the block RAM isn't identical, the features are pretty much identical. It makes it easy for us to port. In the same fashion, the DSP slices are very similar. Um, we have a lot of clocking resources in these devices. Um, the I.O. structures, as you saw with the I.O. 
I logic, O logic, and I O delay is very similar. Um, we have transceivers on all of them, and we have PCI Express. Um, as you look at this, though, you should see some things that aren't the same. And first off, you'll see that this is a column based structure. And so that means, and I don't know that I show it here, this doesn't show it very well. There are actually three columns of I.O. and then the fourth column of, of the transceivers over here. Um, but this is your I.O. ring structure in Spartan land. And that's done so that we can do wire bonding on there. Um, as I said before, Spartan devices give you full 3.3 volt <coughs> compatibility if you need that. Um, and there's just some other minor differences, you know, you have a system monitor in Vertex, not in Spartan. And you have a tri-mode Ethernet Mac in Vertex as well. So that's our difference. And then so you can kind of see, you know, depending upon what you're after, you know, for the lowest cost and, and you know, moderate performance, Spartan's the right choice. For the higher performance, um, you know, Vertex is the right choice. So that's pretty much what I have on the hardware. And like most things, I have to have a commercial here at the end. Um, we are releasing our tools, the next version of our tools, um, the end of this month, so 11.1. I just wanted to mention that for you. Um, we've been doing a lot of work on the incremental flows and partition-based flows to, with the idea that people need to be able to compile their designs in much faster time so you can get more turns per day. Because if you look at these devices and you scale what it takes, might take to do a large Vertex 5 today, you realize that we, we have to do something different. So there's a lot of work been going on there. As I mentioned before, power, um, some things in the memory footprint. But I just wanted to let you know the IS, ISE software, which is now called Integrated Design Suite, because when we release it, um, everybody who has an ISE seat will get what we call plan ahead, will be part of it, chip scope will be part of it. So your only options that you can buy now are you can say, hey, I want to just do logic development, or I want to do logic development and embedded development, or I want to do logic development and DSP development, or I want all everything. But those are your choices. No longer, chip scope is part of the package, I guess is the way to say it. Chip scope, plan ahead, all those tools are part of it. So that's the changes coming, and uh, I want to say thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, let me know. Yes? Improvement. I forgot to ask you what the date was for IDS. So, yeah, the, the, so IDS is out the end of this month. I hate to say the first of next month because April 1st is <laughs> it's kind of an odd day to say, but <laughs> um, so that's when it, it ships. And uh, we have, have it available now internally. Um, the big improvement is using is spending more time using uh, incremental flows is, I think, probably a little better. And I don't know if you've tried that. Meaning right-click, set partition, compile? Um, you mentioned a different word. There's, so there's two different flows, and maybe we need to come in and talk about that. Um, Partition-based flow says, hey, I've got a design, and if I look at it at the top level, I've got multiple blocks in there. And I want to set those as partitions. And as a partition, I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to look at the, at the compiled code. And of course, I have to compile it. And I don't know, is everybody using Xilinx compilers or Simplicity? But if you're using Xilinx compilers, then the compilers will keep it separate. Simplicity can do it through multipoint. Um, and it looks and says, oh, that block hasn't changed. Use the old NCD, use the information in that to keep that placed and routed the same. Um, and then looks for the areas that are changed. There's a little more problem in that um, just with the partition flow um, than in the, stand, in the flow that I call incremental. Incremental says, hey, I'm just doing my design as I've been doing it now. 
um, which is basically it's compiled flat. I mean, all modules are compiled at once. I, whether, um, and then when I come in at that point, I look at my old, the whole database from the previous compile, and I compare it to the database I have on the new compile, looking for changes. And if I don't see changes, you know, I, I at least start with that placement, and that reduces the compile times um, pretty significantly. That is, in this performance improvement that you're showing, where is, is that equally across synthesis and, and placing around, or is it? <clears throat> yeah, I, I should go back to that. You notice I didn't say those words. Um, so um, that that yeah. So the the question has to do with, and let me go see if I can go back here to the very first bullet on the slide. Average two x faster runtime compiles. I don't know what they mean by average 2x <laughs> faster. I can demonstrate some pretty good numbers by using incremental compile. But if I don't change my flow and I don't change my settings, I'm not going to see 2x improvement. You know, I might see, you know, 10% or something like that. But using incremental flow using or partition-based flow, um, you can see dramatic speed-ups on your compiles. And that's some stuff I can help with. Parallel? Yes. Parallel compiles? Parallel. The question from Sandro is, <clears throat> do we do parallel compiles? So this is another interesting topic. Um, so if you look um, in Xilinx um, today, the old way of, of doing design was you ran through um, NGD build. But NGD build today, all the synthesis tools understand the underlying architecture, so NGD build's almost just really a translation from the synthesis database to the um, Xilinx database. It hardly does anything. Then the next step was MAP. And uh, what you've seen over time is MAP has moved to a point where more and more time is being spent in MAP because the performance that you can get in PAR is dramatically impacted by what you do in MAP. So a couple things for you to be aware of. In Vertex 5, um, map dash timing is the only way it runs. It's the same thing with Vertex 6. Um, so you don't really have that option. So it's going to spend more time there. Um, then when you got into PAR, there was this idea that you could place and route it. Well, actually, if you run map dash timing, your, dim your design has already been placed, and all you're doing is routing. So there was this old thing called multi-pass place and route, and some of you guys may have used it a long time ago. Um, but if you think about it, now if I'm down there in par and I spew off a bunch of runs on multi-pass place and route, I probably don't get that much advantage because by the placement and some of the stuff I've done earlier um, will impact the performance I get. So we have the ability now to do some exploration up front that says, hey, instead of doing multi-pass place and route, which can use multiple servers or multiple CPUs, I can use multiple servers at that earlier stage. Um, so there, that is there. We are working as well on, hey, I just got a single compile. I know all my options, and I can take advantage of multiple CPUs. Um, I don't know the performance advantage I get doing that at this point in time. But we are able to do that, and we are putting more and more resources, because clearly that's the way to attack the problem. So any other questions? Uh, your future architecture be begins with F. Uh, does that mean floating point? Well, what, what is this? You got a future architecture in there. Three slides back. Three slides back. <clears throat> okay. Way back, I think I know what you're talking about. Let me not do it this way. Um, um, but let's just say this. I, your, your question really was on floating point, I think. And we do have support for floating point um, soft cores today. Um, I don't know if, it, if there's plans to make a soft or a hard floating point block. 
um, it wouldn't surprise me that's something I could take offline and we could do some checking on. So, yeah. Your first slide on the vertex, your, kind of your motivations, uh, mm -hmm. you had the blackboard and such. There was, one of the points was, uh, you know, being able to actually have it, having a shorter shorter lead time in terms of spinning people up, yeah, shorter design cycle. Mm -hmm. um, what do you other than other than the the, the faster faster uh, I T ideas? Yeah, whatever I see um, <laughs> um, tools. What 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 are we doing to to, to spin yeah. people up faster? That's a good question. So um, what we're doing to help people um, get there is if you've looked, and I know you guys have used our, some of our uh, Xilinx development boards, and you know the past ones, there was a Vertex board and Spartan boards, and there are a fair number of development boards. Um, what we are doing is we're, we're going to a development board strategy where the base development board has a couple of sockets on it, and, and, or connectors, and then we're gonna build daughter boards for those connectors. And you'll, you saw some slides that show these different reference designs. And our idea is we're doing a lot of verification across uh, different uh, areas. So like video, for instance, we'll build a video daughter card. We'll actually um, do some development. I have a customer who's doing uh, uh, what, what I would call video connectivity and we've got complete reference designs from Vertex 5, and we're continuing on with that strategy of not only are we giving you hardware, but we need to get um, either IP, whether as reference designs or through core gen to our customers to help you do your designs, because there's a lot of common things that you might do um, that, um, aren't critical. So like my customer who's doing video connectivity, so what they want to do is they want to take uh, an HD SDI stream coming in, they want to do some of their own processing and, and uh, MPEG encoding on it. Well, we don't, we're not doing the MPEG encoding for them, but as far as they're concerned, they don't care to do the work necessary to take the data from the gigabit transceiver into their FPGA and get it into some data, you know, format into memory. And same thing, they don't want to do it on the other side, so we're providing that design for them. So that's what, that's what we're talking about. Any other questions? Sure. Has um, said anything about future embedded hard processors on the six families? That announcement is coming. So the question was, have we said anything about future embedded hard processors? What I will say is we are committed to future embedded hard processors. We will be doing um, some stuff and we'll be announcing stuff in the sixth generation uh, architectures later this year on embedded hard processors. And we are committed to continuing with embedded hard processors. Anything else? Okay. Hey, thanks again. <laughs>